Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, groundbreaking innovation and the need for it has never been greater. But I am not here today to convince you of that fact because I'm assuming you already buy into this sentiment. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Uh, what I'm here to talk about over the next 18 minutes is how do you actually create groundbreaking ideas and how do you make those ideas happen? So now, before I get into any of that, I thought that maybe I should take about 75 seconds, maybe, uh, maybe 90, to tell you a bit about myself, where I come from, why I am even interested in this topic. Does that make sense to you? All right, I'll do that. Uh, the answer to the question where I come from is my parents. So you need to know something about my parents. My uh, mother is black and Cherokee. My dad is Swedish. They met in Germany. But I was born and raised in Sweden, which is located here. Uh, <laughs> now, something about Sweden during the time I grew up in this country. Okay? Sweden consisted essentially of two groups of people. One group was blonde, blue-eyed, and quite reserved. Uh, and the other group was me, uh, basically. <laughs> which is a joke, obviously, because this was uh, me and my sister. Uh, <laughs> Now, here's my favorite hobby, here's my favorite movies, here's my favorite bo uh, books, and I went to college at Brown, I studied environmental science for the following reasons. And when I did that, I saw something interesting. There were a lot of different scientific researchers at this campus, but I didn't really feel they were able to connect the purpose of the research with each other. I wanted them to do that, so I created a science magazine for that purpose. This inspired me to start a healthcare company based on my aunt's research at Johns Hopkins. After that, I went to business school at Harvard, started a software company, which did quite well, until it didn't. And... Um, <laughs> And then I uh, got an idea for a book, and that idea was based on intersections. I had seen that in my life, whenever I was able to combine ideas from the different cultures I've been exposed to, or from the different industries, industries I've been exposed to, I had a better chance of developing something groundbreaking. And I wondered, is that a general truth for innovation? I decided to research that. It took me far longer than I ever imagined. I was literally down to my last $2.45. Things started turning around. The book came out. People liked it. It's been translated into 18 languages. I get to talk to people like you all over the world. In the middle of this, I got married. Now I have a daughter, actually two. Now I'm here with you. Which basically is my story <laughs> up in this particular point in time. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to do a very quick exercise for everybody in this room right now. I really want you to put your heart into it. I'm going to put up some words on this screen, and I want you to yell out the things that you think of when you see these words. One, two, three, keep on going. All right, are you with me? Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Candy. Go on. Termites. Bikini. Ice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I actually heard some of those words. Uh, and the things that you said are the things that most of us would think of when we see these words, the first things that would come to mind. And I am going to talk about these things today over the next 15 minutes, but here's the connections I'm going to make. You see, there's a connection between candy and computers, there's a connection between termites and architecture, bikinis and burkas is something practical and common, and so does ice and sleeping beds. And the reason for that is because we have the best chance of breaking new ground by using diversity. It is diversity that drives innovation, a diversity of perspectives, of industries, of cultures. When we bring together these different perspectives, we have a far better chance of breaking new ground. You're going to see lots of different perspectives today on this stage. Think about how you can use it to drive new innovation. Let me give an example of what this is I'm talking about. We have this architect. His uh, name is Mick Pierce. And, uh, and he's about to uh, um, create a, uh, a building in Harare uh, in Zimbabwe. Now, this building is to contain, this is the largest building there, but it's to contain no air conditioning. And he manages to actually do this by combining his field of expertise, architecture, with the field of termitology. And so here's how it works. Termites build these mounds on the African savanna. And they need to keep an exact 87 degrees Fahrenheit inside of these mounds in order to grow fungi, which helps them digest wood. Uh, but the thing is that the temperature on the savanna can drop to below 40 degrees at night and rise to over 100 degrees during the day. So, of course, the question is, how do the termites managed to keep an exact 87 degrees Fahrenheit. And here's what they do. They build these vents around the base of the mound, and then they redirect air breezes into these vents into a cool pool of mud, and they circle this air up, and by opening and closing vents constantly, they can regulate the temperature exactly. So McPierce looked at this and said, well, 
Can I use the same principle for my building? This is what he did. East Gate is the largest building there. He uses no air conditioning. It saves him about $4 million right away. And he uses 90% less energy than any other building around it with a steady temperature of about um, 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Innovative? Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's up there. This proves a fundamental fact about why diversity drives innovation. All new ideas are really combinations of existing ideas. This is an example of it. All new ideas are combinations of existing ideas. But here's the thing. Not all idea combinations are created equal. If I tell you I'm going to combine a bikini with a sandy beach, what would you say? <laughs> Aside from awesome, it's pretty obvious. I mean, this connection has been made before, right? But if I tell you I'm going to combine a bikini with a hijab or a burqa, all of a sudden, well, if you can find the connection, it might be innovative. And in fact, a woman named Ahida Sinetti from Lebanon did just that. Traditional Muslim woman. She moves to Australia, uh, which has a very strong beach culture. This is a picture of Bondi Beach, or outside of Sydney. It's an awesome beach. Now, she's a traditional Muslim woman. And she goes to this beach, and she realizes that the dress code for the Australian beach is something like this. But for many traditional Muslim women, if they go swimming, they go swimming in something like that, which is very uncomfortable, which is why most of them end up sitting on the beach while the husbands and kids go swimming. So she looks at this as he goes, Wait, hold on. Why can't I combine my traditional Muslim culture with the Australian beach culture? Why can't I combine a burqa with a bikini? Why can't I create the burkini, which is a burqa out of bikini material and cut? The market size for this product is incredible. Staggering. And the company has grown by leaps and bounds all over the world. But the rule here is that, yes, you can create great new ideas if you combine existing ideas. Okay, but the likelihood of this new idea being innovative increases dramatically if the ideas you combine are far apart, unlikely or unpredictable. For each and every one that comes up here to speak, ask yourself not just what it is that they're saying and how awesome that is, but how is it that you could potentially connect what you do with this person? Because if you find the connection, it might be unique. It might be unique. Most of us would end up, if you look for new ideas for bikinis, Go to the beach and look for them. But so would everybody else. You're not going to set yourself apart that way. Now, there's another reason why diversity drives innovation. And it has to do with another fundamental fact around innovation. And it comes down to that we come up with far more ideas at these intersections of different industries and cultures. And it's a really mathematical argument. Uh, I'm going to sort of walk you through it right now. Imagine that you have Charmin Ecologist. And they're hanging out all with each other, talking to each other about different ideas. Oh, did you hear about this new feeding behavior? Yeah, yeah, very interesting. I saw a new colonizing uh, pattern in, uh, in uh, Namibia. It was fantastic. And they talk and they share ideas. And they can come up with a certain number of ideas. Okay, great. And then over here in this corner you have architects. And they do the same thing. Oh, did you, talk, did you hear about this new steel alloy? Yeah, it's really exciting. And they talk about their ideas and they come up with them. But what would happen if we now combine these two groups? What would happen to the number of ideas that they were able to create, that they were able to combine? You wouldn't just add them. You wouldn't just add these ideas. You would actually multiply them. Because all of a sudden, they can combine ideas from termites and architecture freely. And they would create an exponential increase of idea combinations. And in fact, if you think about the people that are in this room and the number of ideas that they represent, the number of exponential idea combinations that you could essentially create through the conversations you might have here would be incredible. We've actually seen that you can actually make this happen in a team, in a meeting, by introducing somebody from a different perspective. They can go at it from whatever challenge or problem is that you're looking at, and you will see a massive increase of ideas. Okay, so great, you say, well, that's fine. So you, you create diverse teams, or you, you reach out to fields or cultures different from the ones you're in, and you can create an explosion of idea combinations. Great. But why is that useful for innovators? And the reason why is because innovators generate and execute far more ideas. Research has shown that the single strongest correlation to innovative success, whether you talk about artists or scientists or entrepreneurs or 
grant writers or whatever are the number of ideas that you come up with and then try to make happen. Richard Branson has launched over 400 companies. Picasso made over 20,000 works of art. Einstein published over 240 papers. And Google has launched hundreds of companies. Hundreds of companies. Now, why do you believe we see this relationship between quantity and quality of ideas? This comes down to another fundamental fact about innovation, which is we're not particularly good at predicting what ideas are going to work or not work. We might think we are, but that's not true. Richard Branson has had companies, lots of companies that have failed. You know, Picasso made 20,000 works of art, yes, but most of those works of art are collecting dust in basements around the world. Do you know why? Because they suck. <laughs> you think you predicted that? Einstein has written papers that weren't referenced by anybody. Google has launched companies that they've shut down. Yes, they're innovative. Yes, they're brilliant. But the truth is that they break new ground because they keep on trying new things. This is true over and over again. So while at Intersection we can create many ideas, that so it gives us the, the, the opportunity to pursue more of them. We have a higher likelihood of actually breaking new ground because of that. And this actually means that a predictable path to success does not exist. It was not true in the past, and it's certainly not true today, where new competitors and new ideas, new technologies get introduced all the time. We might believe that there is a predictable path. We might believe that if we just sat down and thought about it hard, we can stake out the pathway to success. But remember, if you could do that, then anybody could do it. And everybody would essentially go down the same pathway. And obviously we know that's not the truth. So how do you think about actually executing these types of ideas? That's my second part. You step into intersections to come up with them. The ideas are further apart, like bikinis and burkas. But, but, there's also more of them. So you have access to more ideas, great. But what do you do when you think of one? If there's no predictable pathway for success, you have to put that into your sort of execution plan. And here's how we usually think about executing these types of ideas. Imagine that we have an idea that we think of. And we like it. So, okay, this is a good idea. How should, what should we do now? Maybe we should go in this way to make it happen. And people discuss, say, no, 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 no. We should go in that way. Okay, fine. And then you set up a big goal. A big, amazing, audacious goal. And then you pursue that. And as you do, you use up whatever resources you had for it. And now you're done. And you get to this goal. And you look at what's happened. But in retrospect, in hindsight, you go, you know, if I knew now what I... If I knew then what I knew now, I wouldn't have gone here. I actually would have done that. That would have been a much better way. But I can't get there because I used up all the resources. Is there a better way? Is there a better way? So this is a picture of uh, an area in northern Sweden called Yukasiava. This picture pretty much sums up everything you need to know about that area. Uh, <laughs> it's cold and snowy in the winter, particularly. <laughs> Uh, and this guy named Ingve, he comes up with an idea there. He says, I want to combine the concept of ice with the concept of a hotel. And he creates something called an ice hotel. Now, some of you have heard of this. Uh, this is a building, it's a hotel made entirely out of ice. Everything. The beds you sleep on, the glass you drink from. Do you think this sounds like a good idea? <laughs> no, right? But of course, this has turned out to be one of Sweden's largest tourist attractions. They have over 100,000 visitors a year. In the summer, what happens? It melts, but he cuts up the ice and sells it to ice bars around the world. I think he sells ice to Russia. <laughs> How did he, what, what a visionary, right? Can, look at this. I mean, what, a, what, what an incredible visionary. What a genius. Can any one of us hope to be able to see something like a, like a, just a, a plot of snow and ice and, and create something like this? Well, let's look at how he did it. He had an idea, a big idea, and the idea was to sell the winter because, uh, frankly, uh, there was a lot of it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he had some resources to do so. Okay, fine. And then he decided for the first year he was going to create an ice exhibit. He flew in an ice sculpture from Japan, and they created some ice sculptures, and he wanted to see, can people, are people even willing to travel to this area to see this? And yeah, it worked. It wasn't perfect, uh, but it worked. Spring came early. The ice sculpture melted. All right, next year. Let's try to do a snow gallery. Here he builds a, creates an entire building made out of snow. He has some paintings inside of it. 
People can go and see that. Yeah, it's interesting. Let's really break out. The year after that, he creates an event hall. There's lots of things uh, with ice involved in it. He has, uh, I think, uh, there's some ice bars in there. There's all kinds of interesting new products around the notion of, of winter. And, uh, and some backpackers suggest that, look, we would like to try to sleep on an, on an ice bed. He goes, are you sure? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's what he did. And it turns out they went raving about it. That was the most amazing thing ever. Completely unpredictable. So the year after that, he built an entire building with ice beds. And uh, the rest of that is history. This is the way that innovative breakthroughs happen. And when you look at this, ask yourself, would you be willing to do this step, flying an ice sculptor from Japan? Of course. Anybody in this room could do that. And anybody in this room could take the step that follows. This is how brilliant visionaries are born. They keep on trying new ideas, but they do it, they execute, they try, and they don't wait to go for the amazing large goal. Instead, they take the smallest executable step that presents itself. So, that's basically our message to you. You step into intersections to create new ideas because the world is connected. Hopefully, in these 18 minutes, I've been able to show you that. Termites connect with architecture. Bikinis connect with burkas. Now, how does candy connect with computers? I'm going to let you think about that on your own. So the world is connected, but there's somebody making those connections. I think it should be you. Thank you very much.